Well, uh, thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Uh, it's a great honour, of course, uh, and pleasure for me to address this distinguished gathering here in Glenties, uh, which Patrick McGill called My Little Irish Town. I have been uh, uh, taking holidays very near here in Port New for upwards of 20 years, and I'm extremely uh, fond of the area. And in particular, I may say, of the Highland Hotel, which I can testify from many empirical samplings, serves the best breakfast in West Donegal. I stress this does not mean that I do not get breakfast in my own house, merely that one sometimes wishes uh, for some variety. Now, uh, the honour I feel in addressing you is compounded by the fact that in speaking to you uh, on topics to do with constitutional reform, I'm following in the footsteps of two of our greatest modern jurists, my predecessors in the Supreme Court, Mr. Justice Brian Walsh and Mr. Justice Neil McCarthy. Twenty-three years ago, on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of Bunrock de Heron, and at a time when judges felt extremely inhibited, even more inhibited than at present, about speaking in public, even on the most academic subjects, these two giants of our evolving constitution felt able or possibly even felt obliged to speak in public about their role as defenders and exponents of that constitution. And I'm happy to do so as well, but of course, uh, if you do so, you get to speak with other people such as David Gwyn Morgan, who will comment in the nicest possible way on uh, various cases, some of which may not yet have completed their career. And David, I'm sure, will take no offence if I say that I don't necessarily agree or disagree with what he said uh, on the topic of any of those matters. Um, one thing I do very firmly disagree with, though, is uh, he was kind enough uh, to praise uh, the courts for updating laws to bring them into line with modern contemporary society. I hope I've got what he said correctly. It's not the business of the courts to update laws. On the contrary, it's the business of members of the Oireachtas to update laws. And if the courts were to set about doing that, then they would be usurping the role of members of the Oireachtas, which they uh, must not do. Now, uh, constitutional reform, or even the replacement of the Constitution by another one, uh, is a fairly topical subject of the present time. It's been discussed at various times since the 50th anniversary of de Valera's Constitution in 1987. But it appears that two things have conspired to bring it to the fore at the moment. One is the impending centenary of the 1916 Rising and the proclamation which announced it. The second is, and it shows the power wielded in our society by RTE, the recent television programme Aftershock, Where To Now, which trenchantly proposed the adoption of a new constitution based on the 1916 proclamation. Now, things like that naturally give food to thought for thought to various people, including myself. What I hope to do this afternoon is to offer some general thoughts about the constitutions and their reform, especially in the present era of internationally binding instruments of various kinds of human rights, and to suggest some considerations to be borne in mind on reforming a domestic constitution. But I won't discuss any particular proposed amendment because that's a matter for the political domain. A constitution is what's expressed in German as the Grundnorm, the basic law. In a country which is very largely homogeneous, as perhaps certain Islamic republicans, republics are today, and as perhaps Ireland was at some stage in the past, the values that inform such a document are not hard to express. But in a society which is for many reasons complex and diverse, partly due to the abandonment or recasting of old certainties, and partly because of demographic change, it is probably true to say of Ireland's needs for a constitution. What the great jurist Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes said about those of the United States more than a century ago, what he said is there was this, a constitution is not intended to embody a particular economic theory, whether of paternalism and the organic relation of the citizen to the state or of laissez-faire. It is made for people of fundamentally differing views. And the accident of our finding certain opinions natural and familiar 
or novel and even shocking, ought not to conclude our judgment on the question of whether statutes embodying them are in conflict with the Constitution. Now, by contrast with that view, which I firmly believe is one worth considering very seriously, the makers of the television programme I've mentioned took a much more unitary view, insisting that our present Constitution is much too complex and is facially flawed in providing too many rights, all of which must be balanced, they complain, one against the other. They say that what is needed is a simpler, less nuanced document modelled on the 1916 proclamation. In particular, they say, conferring too many constitutional rights allows the privilege in society to exploit them and thus bring about the scandal of impunity. Uh, they say the law of libel based on the constitutional right to a citizen's good name prevents investigations, the protection of property prote rights protects the rich, and so on. Some of this is simply mi misconceived, um, you may think. Uh, the, the most recent significant case in which the Supreme Court considered the property rights guarantee was the reference by the President to the Court of the, under Article 26 of the Constitution of the Health Amendment Bill No. 2 to, in 2004. You may remember this, it was to do with money, mostly pensions, taken from old people in residential homes uh, and the attempt to adjust that situation when it transpired that there was no legal authority to do it. The question was, was this an unjust attack on property rights um, within uh, the meaning of Article 43 of the Constitution? And the Court held that the presence or absence of compensation was an important feature in deciding whether or not it was such an unjust attack. If I may quote uh, a, a, a writer in an academic book, Carolyn and Doyle, uh, on this topic, they say, not the least of the valuable insights pro provided by the Health Amendment Bill reference is that it occurred in the context of the repayment of pension payments to old people in nursing home care, and thus demonstrates that property rights far from being the preserve of the rich, are of real value to some of the weakest and most overlooked in our society. I mention that to indicate that things may be more complex and more varied than uh, certain commentators who perhaps uh, approach things from a party pre-position make allowance for. Notwithstanding that, the programme I mention proposed, and I quote, that we scrap Bonrot de Heron and replace it with a short and simple constitution that's inspired by the proclamation. Well, I, I propose that we scrap Euclid and in, uh, replace it with a very much simpler uh, form of geometry, which will be democratically based in that everybody will be able to understand it. Um, not more than 500 words, please. Um, such a document, a document like the proclamation, you may think is not a model or a reasonable inspiration for a democratic constitution. The provisions in Bonrock de Heron about how governmental power is to be exercised may be tedious to read, but they emphasize a fundamental, the fundamentally democratic nature of the state, whereas the, pro the proclamation is the apologia of the dramatic military action of a group which, according to historians like the Reverend F.X. Martin, uh, was proceeding from a minority position. The revised Articles 2 and 3 of de Valera's Constitution, approved at referendum, may be less rhetorical, high-blown and heroic, but are very arguably more adapted to the, to the reality and to the democratic uh, consensus than the proclamation's policy of simply ignoring those who don't uh, agree with it. Of course, the proclamation, which was the work of a body called the Provisional Government of Ireland, was actually the second provisional government established within two years. The previous one was established in September 1914 by the signatories of the Ulster Covenant. And they too simply ignored the existence of those who didn't uh, agree with it. But that is uh, purely a historical uh, observation. A constitution is not a pronunciamento. It's a document of an altogether different nature. In a case in 1987 called H. v. John Murphy and Sons Limited, 
Mr. Justice Declan Costello said something which I think is equally true. It must be remembered that the Court, in, co in construing a constitutional document whose primary purpose in the field of fundamental rights is to protect the citizens from unjust laws enacted by the legislature or from arbitrary acts committed by state officials. And that is something that needs, that's what a constitution does insofar as it's a, an instrument of, of rights. I would imagine that if, if it's given some thought, almost anybody, everybody would agree with that statement of the role of the human rights portions of a constitution. I think it would also be agreed, at least on reflection, by almost all constitutional thinkers, except perhaps outright advocates of a political or ideologically engaged judiciary. There are such people, often on this side of the Atlantic, formerly of a Marxist orientation. Some people even hanker for the days when the Soviet Union's chief prosecutor, uh, Mr. Andrei Vyshinsky, could say, the laws of Soviet power are a political directive, and the work of a judge is not the application of law in conformity with, judicial, with bourgeois judicial logic, but the application of the law as a political expression of the party and the government. The judge must be a political worker, rapidly and precisely applying the directives of the party and the government. Well, to those who think that in that way, there is really very little dialogue to be had. But our answer to it, the reason we do not regard the courts as the creature of any particular government, can be expressed in three words, or, uh, separation of powers. And these have to be maintained, and maintained by a sedulous respect on the part of each of the organs of government for the prerogatives of the other, the, the, the three being the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. And heretofore, that has been... Uh, has been vigorously observed, I think, in, in, in this country. Um, the, the critics, uh, the sort of people who embrace the view of Mr. Mashinsky, are fundamentally people who are keen forever to be forever ordering other people about. I have learnt whatever law I know from various sources, but I'm not ashamed to say that part of it I learnt from watching The Simpsons with my youngest son, who is very, very fond of it. And Marge Simpson, who is a great jurisprudential philosopher, though that is little recognised, she said something which, if I had my way, I would write in letters ten foot high on public buildings. She said, you can't use the law to nag. <laughs> but there are those who think that it can be used, not only to nag, but to batter into submission. I may say another thing, not at all relevant to the courts, of course, but you may be aware of the unfortunate position of Grandad Simpson. Uh, Marge has taken all his money off him uh, for various perfectly good family reasons. And he lives in the Springfield Retirement Castle, where Marge visits him quite often. And when she does, she passes a sign in the foyer which says, thank you for never mentioning the real world. <laughs> and uh, that too... Uh, has, its, has its proper possibilities. Now, I'd also like to say, some people think that because the Constitution is a certain age, and ours is well over pension age, being 73 years old, um, or because it's of a certain length, that those are good reasons in themselves for changing it. Um, th that simply isn't so. The United States Constitution is over three times as old as ours, and the Bill of Rights dates, which David Gwynne Morgan is mentioning, dates from 1688. But these documents have been the basis of an ex expanding of civil liberties and of political rights in Britain and America, respectively, or sorry, in America and Britain, respectively, for all of that time. A constitution takes on, like an antique, it takes on a patina over a, a long period of time. Its authority tends to increase. Merely because a constitution is of a certain length, despite the aftershock program, is not a reason for replacing it with a shorter one. Nor, as the embattled constitutional litigation, which is an enormous feature of the American and French policies, um, demonstrate, a shorter constitution is not even a guarantee that there will be less 
uh, litigation. Now, in the aftershock view of constitutional reform, they actually advocate cutting back on constitutional rights. They say, and I'm quoting, uh, when you have got a very complicated constitution as we have, one of the things you get is that these different competing rights, one of the reasons I think we have impunity, for example, for a lot of crimes which have terrible consequences, particularly white-collar crimes, is that people have rights and are able to hide behind the Constitution. That's a very interesting thought. This, it's a heartfelt demand for simplicity and an absence of technicality. And it may be quite understandable, but if acted upon, would simply end the constitutional recognition of some rights altogether. Let us remember the simplest possible statement or demand for rights, liberty, equality and fraternity which echoed through the streets of Paris about 230 years ago. But a society with total liberty would soon be short on equality, and a society with total equality, assuming that such a thing were possible, because even in the Soviet Union dedicated to equality, there was, if you remember, a central lane on the road on which only public officials could drive. Funny that. Um, with total equality, we'll have no liberty. Even at this most general level, these rights must be balanced and must be permitted to qualify each other. Without such a process, they're simply mutually exclusive. Similarly, in the post-9-11 world, liberty and security require to be balanced, if either is to exist in reality. The complexity involved in this process doesn't arise from a particular length of constitution or a particular type of constitution. It arises from the adherent complexities of the human condition itself. Another consequence of this complexity is, is that, as Justice Scalia of the United States Supreme Court has said, a judge who takes his oath seriously will often find himself deciding against his personal preference. In 1972, uh, a black gentleman would, was a would-be guest at a Moose Lodge club in the southern United States. But the Moose Lodge club would only admit Caucasians, either as members or, or as guests. Justice William O. Douglas, who was an American liberal icon, had this to say. The associational rights which our system honours permits all white, all black, all brown and all yellow clubs to be formed. They also permit all Catholic, all Jewish, or all agnostic clubs to be established. Government may not tell a man or woman who his associates are to be. The individual can be as selective as he desires. So the fact that the Moose Lodge Club only allows Caucasians to join or come as guests is constitutionally irrelevant as the decision of the black Muslims to admit to their services only members of their own race. Now that statement of principle uh, permitting forms of discrimination on racial grounds, which were clearly personally abhorrent uh, to some of the justices, was joined in by Justice Thurgood Marshall, the first black justice of the United States Supreme Court. What the aftershock program, when the aftershock program complains of impunity, it make, its makers clearly desire to make it easier to establish criminal liability by ending or qualifying rights already existing. And uh, as to this, I would simply quote what uh, ju uh, uh, Mrs. Justice McGuinness, whom uh, Mary O'Rourke quoted earlier, had to say uh, in 1998 about a case tending to end the privilege against self-incrimination. She said, the state's argument here seems to me to tend towards the sophisticated version of the innocent have nothing to fear, which I would not accept as being sufficient to offset a threat to the privilege against self-incrimination. There have been sufficient miscarriages of justice in the history of crime in this and other jurisdictions to indicate that the belief that the innocent have nothing to fear is not necessarily the whole answer. But nevertheless, that mantra is the basis of a lot of public discourse on legal and constitutional topics. Uh, I would just like to quote here for your consideration the words of a cynical but thankfully a fictitious politician, in Alan Bennett's play, The History Boys. I hope some of you may have uh, seen this play. The central character is Mr. Irwin, a cynical, exam-obsessed history teacher. 
He tells the boys who are doing a history scholarship for entry to Oxford that you really get no marks for saying that the Japanese invaded Pearl Harbour. They know that, and what can you say about it? Instead, he said, say that the Americans invaded Japan. He said, it's not true, but it will give you 90 seconds of the attention of the examiner. And besides, he said, if, you really, if you're clever enough to deserve a scholarship, you'll be able to think of a sense in which it's true. Well, in any event, you'll be happy to hear that Mr. Irwin doesn't stay a history teacher all his life. He becomes the Home Secretary. And he's quoted at the beginning of the play, and it's only in the play version, it's not in the film version, he's seen addressing his own MPs and trying to calm their nerves about the very strong security measures he's bringing in. He says, well, this is the tricky one. The effect of this bill will be to abolish trial by jury in at least half of the cases that come before the criminal courts and, to a significant extent, abolish the presumption of innocence. Our strategy should therefore be to insist that the bill actually increases the liberty of the subject, which truly viewed consists of the freedom to walk the streets unmolested, etc., etc., Please try not to be shrill or earnest. An amused tolerance comes over best, especially on television. Paradox works well and mists up the windows. Use phrases like, the loss of liberty is the price we pay for freedom, that kind of thing. <laughs> and incredibly, I don't know if Mr. John Reed, the former Glasgow communist, who ended up as one of Tony Blair's infinite succession of well-built home secretaries. I don't know if he'd ever seen the History Boys, but Mr. Reid actually said in an article in the Guardian newspaper, liberty must be rationed, but only temporarily and to prevent its abuse. Well, <laughs> Mr. Bennett should consider using that. Now, if I'm, I'll be very quick now. Ireland is a party to lots of international instruments on human rights. The most important for many purposes is the European Convention on Human Rights. Not merely that, but it appears, though it's not yet certain, the EU as an, as an institution is likely to sign up to it as well, thereby binding ourselves twice to it. We have to bear in mind that certain rights are protected by that convention so that we will be bound to respect them whether or not we change our constitution. Two of these uh, rights curiously, are the right to reputation and good name, which is protected in paragraph one of the first protocol to the convention, and the other, another is the right of private property. If, therefore, we wished to wholly prescind from these uh, things, it would be necessary to consider a, a, a derogation. There's just two other things I'd like to say, because in the topic of the many subjects which come up in constitutional uh, discussion. The first is, it's very unwise to put something into a constitution for purely decorative purposes. Nothing is more certain now than that we will have, uh, there will be litigation about any, cha any words put into the constitution. Somebody will use them against somebody else. You don't have to go back very far to think of an amendment to the constitution which was used in litigation, which was probably unenvisaged by the huge majority of people uh, who, uh, who, who voted for it. The second thing is, you, it's necessary to consider about any particular proposed constitutional change, who will this make more powerful and who will it make less powerful? That is an essential question. And if constitutional rights are given, to a person or a group of people or a body or a concept. Examples, very young children, animals, uh, the concepts like the public good or the environment. These will not be able to assert these rights themselves. Who will they be asserted by? They'll be asserted by whatever third party gets to speak for the protected interest. And that is something that uh, it's not an argument against changing the Constitution in any particular way. It's something that simply requires consideration. And I, I, I trust that in that context, and perhaps in others, I've suggested uh, some thoughts which suggest that changing the Constitution in favour of motherhood and apple pie is a nice thing to do, and it really makes you feel good. <laughs>
But it may not be quite so simple uh, as a, a, a very idealistic view of it would suggest. Thank you.